I think one of the things we're supposed to do is tell our story. When it's of interest to somebody, um, we're supposed to pay attention to the way that God is revealing himself to us in the ordinary stuff of our lives and then bear witness to it, you know, tell our stories. And if you happen to be a songwriter, that can be a great way to do it. If you happen to be a painter, that can be a great way to do it. But it also can just be going out for a Coke with somebody and being willing to tell your story and even better, get them to tell their story. Listening well to someone else and helping them discover what God has put inside of them that they're maybe not even awake to yet. Welcome to the Christian Music Archive podcast, conversations about Christ, community, and music. I'm your host, Dave Maurer. This week, I got to sit down with Carolyn Ahrens. Now, I've long respected Carolyn as a thoughtful songwriter who writes some interesting and intelligent lyrics. She has a brand new album coming out just in time to celebrate 25 years in Christian music. Man, I can't believe it's been that long already. But Carolyn is also an author and has written for Christianity Today, as well as published a number of books. She's a speaker and a spiritual coach, but I'll let her tell you about all that. I hope those of you who are familiar with Carolyn Ahrens will enjoy this conversation, but I'm equally excited to introduce those of you who don't know Carolyn to an amazing, creative, and caring lady. So, without further ado, welcome to the podcast, Carolyn. Thanks, Dave. I've been looking forward to this. So let's start with uh, who is Carolyn Ahrens and uh, how did you get started in music? Wow. Who is Carolyn Ahrens? This is a big, (laughs) big question. (laughs) I I am a Canadian, grew up, uh, I'm talking to you from just outside of Vancouver, Canada, and how I got started in music. I I grew up um, with parents who loved music. And uh, I was a really um, painfully shy kid when I was young. And I, when I was about 10, my dad brought home a guitar. I still remember it was a, an orange guitar, an orange gut string guitar. And we started learning guitar together. I think the first song we learned was Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> But within a few weeks of, of that guitar coming into our home, I wrote my first song. Oh, wow. Which was, uh, yeah, it was like a song for Mother's Day. And it was a big hit in the household. And <laughs> and I uh, I discovered, you know, that uh, for a shy kid, that writing songs was a way to have a voice. It was a way it ah. was a way for me to pray. It was a way for me to journal, you know. And so I was hooked pretty young. I started, uh, yeah, very young. And then how that became a career. I mean, uh, all the time growing up, I knew that music was a passion and a gift Right. Uh, uh, that, you know, I don't mean that I was gifted. I mean that it was a gift in my life to be able to sure. do music. Um, uh, but I never really dreamed of it as a, as a vocational path, you know, that seemed like something right. that would happen to extraordinary people. Um, but when I was in university, I went to, um, my mom and I, one summer, we went to uh, the Christian Artist Seminar. I don't know if anybody remembers that. but it used Oh, yeah, to be- at the Rockies, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. So I went there and, um, you know, played some uh, rough demos of songs that had been recorded in the basement of a church. And I wasn't even singing them. I, 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 uh, I was an alto and a back then an alto in a sandy patty world and yeah. so uh, <laughs> yeah yeah I, <laughs> I didn't even think I could sing so I had other people s- singing these songs but I uh, a couple of publishers there took interest in my songwriting and sort of one thing led to another so that by the time I was graduating from university I had an offer to sign my first publishing deal ah. um, yeah, with a company in Nashville. And I, and so I started out writing songs for other people and then gradually, it's a long story, but gradually grew into um, discovering I was maybe called to sing them myself. So when you were writing songs, were you like on spec? You had to write so many songs uh, for a, you know about every month or did you have specific people you were asked to write for or how did that work? 
Yeah, kind of all of that. So I my first publishing deal was with was with Benson Records. Again, we're going way oh, back sure. in the yeah. archives here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and a woman named Andrea took a real interest in my music and really encouraged me. And so the first time I ever flew to Nashville was to sign that that deal. Oh, and, how fun! Uh, yeah, I was twenty one, just graduated, just gotten married to my husband Mark, and I was working as the director of a crisis pregnancy center. And they could only um, they could only afford to pay me uh, half time. So I would work full time and then bank enough hours to take trips quarterly to Nashville and okay. um, and write songs. And uh, so I don't think I had a quota I had to write, but I was very prolific in those days. Very, very different than now, um, yeah. but very prolific in those days. And yeah, I would uh, I would they would give me a list of artists who were looking for songs or they would look at my songs and see how they might fit various artists. And that's how I started out. So I know because I've seen you in print a lot of places that you don't just write songs, you write uh, publications, you write books. So was that an outgrowth of writing music? Yeah. So I think probably, you know, I said when I was a kid, I wouldn't have said I would have dreamed of a career in music, even though I was writing music all the time. I might have said when I was a kid that I wanted to be an author because I oh. loved I loved books so much. And so they, the two things do seem to be related. It's kind of a communication language thing. I, uh, I remember um, uh, my friend Roy, who's who co-produces a lot of my music, I, me saying to him, I'm so scattered. I do, you know, I do this, this kind of writing <laughs> and that kind of writing. And he said, no, you just, you, you communicate about ultimate things in a variety of ways. And that helped me feel uh, more cohesive. So mm, yeah. yeah, when I, when I was about uh, three albums into my own career, I was releasing music with reunion records. When my third album came out, um, reunion asked me to write a little piece of prose to go with the album. And I was, okay. I had uh, just lost a friend. We had just lost Rich Mullins. Oh, right. and, yeah. um, and I also had just had my first child. So I'd had these two momentous life events happen. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah. And so I wrote this little piece of prose to go with the album kind of about those experiences. And I got, you know, as many people interacting with the prose as with the music. And so, ah, um, yeah. So uh, that's how the idea of, um, writing books developed. And so I did that. And then eventually uh, a friend of mine at Christianity Today that was always reviewing my music there said, hey, do you want to be a columnist here? You know, I've read some of your some of your prose and some of your book writing. And I said, sure, I'll try that. So for about five years, I wrote a column for uh, Christianity Today. So I kind of flipped back and forth between those two worlds, you know, music yeah. with uh, words with music and words without music. Yeah. And and you ended up teaching writing as well, right? Isn't that correct? Yeah, mostly song teaching songwriting. Okay. Yeah, I, I um uh for many years uh at a local college here and then also adjunct at some other places. Um got to teach songwriting and another course called um uh art of performance which was about um, kind of overcoming stage fright, especially for oh. like young worship art students and stuff who would find they, they'd get in their own way when they were trying to help right. facilitate yeah. worship for people. So th it was kind of neat to be able to take my journey with having been really shy and having a lot of stage fright early on and be able to um, uh, teach, you know, these young college kids what I had learned and what, what can help. That brings up an interesting thing for me. So you, you talked about being really shy when you started out. You yeah. don't come across shy on stage. So there's obviously a transformation <laughs> that happened there or a grace of God or something. Yeah. Well, okay. So we got to, um, this is like, this is your life. Thank you. It's fun. <laughs> um, so, so I, I got, we got in my story to the point of signing a publishing deal with Benson. And right. I had met my publisher at this this Christian artist seminar in the Rockies. So I, I was either a year later or two years later, I went back to 
the Christian Artist Seminar, but this time as a panelist, because now I was assigned songwriter. So that was really fun uh, to go from yeah. being, you know, the, the scared kid with the demo tapes to coming back as a panelist. So that was super fun. So I, but I was thinking, okay, this is perfect. I can have a career as a writer for other people. Right. And I, I can have that creative outlet, uh, but I don't have to put myself out there. I don't have to be an artist and, and go out on stage. But while I was at the, the, the seminar the second time as a panelist, I had some downtime one afternoon. And um, so I slipped into the back of a Tom Jackson uh, oh, sure. uh, workshop. Yeah, and Tom is still around, still doing the right. same thing. And it's it's so good. So Tom does this like kind of performance coaching, helping people with stage fright, helping them communicate well on stage. So I snuck into the back of this thing. And he was talking about that. Uh, you know, a lot of people who are performing artists, they think that when somebody comes to a concert, it's to be impressed, right? And so they, yeah. they think that that it's about, you know, how many octaves you have vocally or the lights or the wardrobe right. or whatever. And he said, you know, that's not it, that, um, of course, those things can help. But really why somebody would come to a gathering like that is to make a connection and to, right. to feel feel loved. And I, you know, that immediately rang a bell for me because I thought, yeah, like every concert that's been amazing to me, I have felt this connection both with the, the people that I, you know, the people that are singing along right. in the crowd and yeah. also with the artists, you know, like Bono is singing to me. He's singing yeah, to I'm me about my room. life, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, I thought, okay, that's true. That's true. So I was tracking with him. And then he said something that, that really, you know, that really literally changed my life. He said, your job, anytime you find yourself on any kind of stage or platform, you're, you're called to be there. And your job when you're there is uh, to love whoever's in the room. It's to take everything uh -huh. that you have and offer it in service to whoever's in the room. So your job is to love. And then he said, Always remember the enemy of love is self-consciousness. I realized as a shy person that that was true of me. It was not only the reason why I had stage fright, but it also kept me from loving people well in all kinds of contexts in my life. Oh, like wow. I, yeah. yeah, you know, like um, it kept me from, if I was checking out groceries, I, I was, I'm terrible at small talk. And so I would, instead of seeing the cashier as this kind of beloved image bearer of God that I was having a chance to encounter, you know, a unique person in the universe, I would just think, oh, I'm terrible at small talk and look away and, and be awkward. And my self-consciousness was keeping me from loving that, that person well. And so I thought, man, there, there's something here. So literally- That's powerful. After yeah, right. So after after that um, time in Colorado, I came back home and I had a gig I had agreed to play at like kind of a songwriter showcase at a little okay. listening room club thing in Vancouver. And, you know, as usual, I was super nervous. Why did I say I'd do this? You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I went. But before I went, it was, you know, I was in the green room and I was waiting to go out and I prayed and I said, OK, Tonight, I want to love the people here. Please help me get over my self-consciousness because it's getting wow. in the way of me loving people. And I went out on stage and it was it was night and day from any other time I'd gone on a stage because, wow. yeah, I wasn't thinking about myself. I was like suddenly very curious about the people there. Why were they, why had they come out on a rainy Thursday night? What was, what were they yeah. looking for? You know, what, what, what kind of hunger had brought them to this place? And, and for the first time I wasn't thinking about, am I going to mess up this song or say something stupid? I was thinking about them and it made performing an absolute blast. Like it just completely changed, uh, the experience of being on stage for me. And I've kind of been having fun with it ever since. So that prayer was a switch almost. I yeah. mean, it was that, it was that sudden, that dramatic. Yeah. And it's, it feels corny telling that story because so, you know, I believe most change in life happens very slowly and incrementally. And that's that, you know, it takes a long time to move the needle. Um, but in this particular case, yeah, it was literally like a 180 to have that wow. realization. Yeah. So that kind of brings me back around to another part of the story, which kind of parallels this. You talked about, you know, some of the early, early stuff you were writing was about your faith. How did your, how did your faith grow and how did you grow into the faith? 
I, I don't know if you're like me or most kids, I think, have faith because mom and dad said we're mm-hmm. going to go to church. Mm-hmm. So h- how did you become exposed to Christ as not only a God you serve, but as my my Abba Father? Well, I did uh, I did grow up in the church and I did grow up with parents who, uh, you know, not only were religious, but faith was a living, palpable right. thing in our home. So I'm very grateful for that. And I will say that um, quite young, I had a sense of God's, um, you know, that God was real and personal and involved in my life. I'm very grateful for that. And I I remember that from very young, but there was a time. um, So, so all the time growing up, it was actually kind of hard for me to understand how someone could, could, not believe in God, you know, because mm-hmm. it, yeah. he just seemed so obvious to me, right? Like his, yeah. he just seemed so infused everywhere. Like you couldn't, how could you have a chocolate ice cream and not believe in God? You know, how could you <laughs> hear Bach or hear the Beatles and not believe in God, right? So that's that was kind of how I was as, you know, as a kid and as a young adult. But in, in probably when I was about 25, I had this summer and actually my husband, Mark, and I had... We'd gone to Nashville for the summer. My music career was just kind of taking off. So we were staying with some friends. Um, and and it was it should have been a really fun summer. Like everything was right. going really well and we were with good friends. But I I it I something happened and it was the first time in my life that I couldn't sense God's presence. Like I just I and I didn't even know why. I didn't know what variables um were creating that experience and it and it created a very deep uh, panic for me, oh, really. I, I mean, I didn't really, yeah, I didn't really express it to him, but, but um, so it was, I, that was a, looking back on it, I see a couple of things. One is that I see that what God was working through with me was, uh, there are many, many pluses to growing up knowing God. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe a downside is I had him pretty domesticated. You know, mm-hmm. I really thought mm-hmm. yeah. I understood him, right? Yeah. And so I, I think some of some some of uh, sort of you know to use a phrase that people sometimes use, the box that I had God in had to get broken open because, uh, right? Um, you, you know, God is nearer than we can imagine, but He's also bigger than we can possibly yeah. imagine. Yeah. Right. And so I think that part of that was what was going on. I also learned later how often that is a part of someone's spiritual journey, but, you know, sometimes they gets called a dark night of the soul or something like that, where right. there's a period where you're being asked to go into a deeper place of mystery, a deeper place of uh, faith and trust uh, as um, as God invites you to sort of grow up in your, mm-hmm. in your faith. And so back then, I wish I'd known how mu- how common that is in, in the spiritual journey, because I think it still would have been hard, but I wouldn't have panicked so much, you know, I wouldn't oh, right. have, um, I'm not like the I'm, only one going through this. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. To know that there's, there's precedent. Um, but for me, it was, it was tough the whole summer. And then kind of a turning point for me was, um, my husband, Mark and I had driven to Nashville for the summer and we were, you know, we were poor, poor, he was a teacher, I was a young musician. And so we had done the drive, it's 56 hours. So we had done it in oh, these wow. three, three 18 hour days to minimize Oof. hotel costs, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but on the way home that summer, we hit uh, the canyons of Utah, like right at sunset. Oh, and we had, uh, yeah, on the way there, it had been dark and rainy. And so we had, we just had known the road was windy. We hadn't even seen what we were really driving through, but on the way home, we hit these, these canyons right at sunset. And ha- have you, have you been there? You yeah. Know, yeah. I've driven the through them. They're yeah. just stunning. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And so it was breathtakingly beautiful. And I, uh, it kind of opened me up again to wonder and transcendence and the fact mm. that where does all this beauty come from? You know, where, there's got to be a source. And then I kind of had, um, you know, in the in the book of Job, when when Job says to God, you've got to explain these mysteries to me and why yeah. you don't behave the way I think you're going to behave. <laughs> and yeah. and God, God says to him, look, when you can figure out how I made, you know, an antelope or how I can 
how I can control the tides or, you know, um, you, you can't even understand these things that are super easy for me as God, right. you know, these, these physical mysteries. How, how can you understand these deeper mysteries? And I had always, when I'd read that passage before that summer, I had always thought, you know, that God was almost kind of scolding Job a little bit. Um, and for the first time, when I hit, when I hit those Rockies after this really difficult summer with God or hit the, the mountains and right. the canyons, I felt like, you know, kind of a poor man's job. And like that God was saying to me, look, you can't even begin to understand how I made this happen. How can mm. I possibly explain, you know, the mysteries of, uh, you know, the problem, the pain in the world that have been something I've been struggling with, um, uh, you know, all these deeper mysteries. And I, I didn't hear him say it to me like he was scolding me. I heard him say it to me the way I might say uh, later when I had kids to my kids, I can't explain this to you yet. You're not capable of understanding it yet. I love you. You're going to have to trust me. And um, and that was the beginning of a new, uh, you know, you said earlier, when, when, when you grow up, at some point you have to move from your parents' faith to your faith. And I, I think that was part of how I had to be grown up in the faith. It's going to be different for everyone. But for me, it was to... Uh, let go of some of the certainty I'd had and the way that I had sort of nailed down life with God previously and being invited into a God who was still very close, very good, but also mysterious and big. And it, and it started, started me on a journey of a faith um, that can not only survive questions, but sort of thrive in the middle of them and can see uh, questions and, and doubt and grappling with God, not as a threat to faith, but as an invitation into deeper faith. Yeah. Well, I, I know for me, I, I was born a preacher's kid, a missionary kid, uh, you know, around the church all the time, around belief all the time. And so for me, I, I kind of like, like you had this, like you said, how can you not believe in God? It's the same as chocolate ice cream. It's just always there, right? Right. It wasn't until I went through that dark time that I realized, oh, I get it. God is personal for me mm. and real for me. And and I think one of the problems that we often have as a church is we forget to tell our young people specifically, also older people, that it's okay to have these questions. It's okay mm-hmm. to struggle with answers to things that are bigger than us. Um, but I think it's helpful for us to hear stories like yours of, I had to come to the point where I, I realized that God loved me for me. Right. And and he cares about me for me. And like you said, not having to understand everything, but to right. be able to say, okay, I trust you, Lord, that you know it's best for me, and I'm going to have to learn to accept that. And that, I think, is hard for all of us to grasp. It really is. And I think, I, I think you're absolutely right. And to build on that, I think it's incredibly important to come to God when we're not sure about him (laughs) or when we have, when we have questions about what he's up to or even about his uh, reality or whatever. Like if if you go to the Psalms and look at what percentage of the Psalms is complaining to God (laughs) and say, you know, like, like, where are you and what's going on? Like, you know, um, that realizing that those places where we have some cognitive dissonance or we're not sure, or we have misgivings, Instead of like, people use, tend to go one of two directions with that. They either say, oh, there's some things I'm not sure about here, so I'm going to chuck faith entirely. Right. I'm just going to walk away. Yep. Or or they go, um, uh, boy, it's not becoming or it's not appropriate for me to have these kinds of thoughts about God. And so I'm going to stuff them down and pretend they're not here, you know, as right. if God doesn't know. Right. And yeah. so. But what we see in scripture is we don't see people that never had questions or even complaints for God. We see people that kept coming to God with that stuff, you know, yeah. even the, the, the less, you know, the less sort of ideal looking stuff. They kept coming to him and saying, how long, oh Lord, or I don't get what you're doing here or, you know, come on, where are you? And so to, to begin to realize that, you know, lament, complaining to God, coming to God when we're not sure keeping up the conversation is actually an act of faith, you know, because it's saying, I think you're there and I think you actually care. And, and to, to realize that God is 
absolutely big enough to handle our questions. And it's just so much better. Uh, I think there's a line in the first book I wrote, which, which, um, where I tell, you know, a longer version of this story of my, sure. uh, my, my first encounter with doubt. Um, but there's a line in that book where I say everything in us has to be prayed out or left to fester. Hmm. And I really believe that. So, you know, anyone listening to us who is, has thought some thoughts about their, about God, about themselves, um, that they think, man, I can never say that out loud, say it out loud to God. Mm. Like he can handle it and give him access to that part of yourself and yes. see what he does, does with it. So you had mentioned that going to Nashville that summer, mm-hmm. you had had some stuff that you were struggling with. And I'm sure you had been asking God for direction during that time. Mm-hmm. Did you hear answers through that time? Or was it just one of these things of I, you have to be faithful, you have to keep asking, and then all of a sudden on the drive home, it was revealed in a new way? Yeah, was, yeah. Was that because that's not the switch that you know turns your shyness off? <laughs> no, you're exactly right. I mean, I'm still on that journey, and that was that was 25 years ago. So yes, and that's that's what's funny about the the switch with you know learning that self consciousness is the enemy of love, and how how drastically that changed things for me, and how quickly. Whereas I think with most things with God. Um, it takes time. It takes a lifetime. Um, and that is right and good. I, I think God is moving in us and changing us, uh, changing us as quickly as he possibly can without kind of blowing us up. <laughs> but, it, <laughs> right. but it just, it just takes time. You know, I mean, I've, I've carried a baby to term that takes a maddening amount of time that takes right. 40 weeks. Um, and you want it to be over much faster but right. if it happened in a day i mean literally I, I hope this isn't too graphic a metaphor for anyone but <laughs> but literally if you got you know if you went to full term in a day you your synapse you know your 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 te- everything in your body would explode right yes. like it just it could you need time to stretch and grow and accommodate new life yeah. and i think our life with god is like that times a billion you know god hmm. has so much to show us and invite us into but he has he has to do it very gradually and or we would explode you know we just we yeah. just need time uh to grow and expand and 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 get to know him better and so yeah that that summer it seemed to me like God was silent. Now, looking back, I can see people he was putting in my life, overtures mm-hmm. he was making to me in various ways, things he was inviting me into in new ways. But at the time, I couldn't, I couldn't see that. Um, uh, but that's, again, why I think, you know, when, when Jesus was asked about prayer when he was here, right. most, of the, most of the parables that he gives about prayer are persistence parables. They're mm, stories right. about hanging in there. And I, you know, I used to read them and think, um, what, what's the deal here? Like, do you want us to nag you into, you know, into, into giving us what we want sort of thing? And, but the longer I've lived life with God, the more I realized, no, he, he told those stories out of empathy for us and what it's like to be on this side of the, of the veil, you know, as finite creatures uh, in relationship with an infinite God. And he was saying, trust me, my father is good. I can tell you this. Mm -hmm. My father is good. So even when it seems like nothing is going on, when it seems like he's not answering you, just don't stop the conversation. You know, nothing, nothing will kill a relationship faster than the silent treatment. You know, don't go silent. Keep. And that's why that's such a huge thing for me to keep talking it out with God, even when it feels like you're not hearing anything um, to just Keep talking out, trust, see what happens. Now, you mentioned that looking back, you saw that God had placed people and situations in your life that was actually helping prepare you for that answer. Mm-hmm. How long did it take you for you to realize that? I mean, I know for me, when I have when I have problems or concerns or I have a, a bad week or whatever, I tend to withdraw into myself rather than allowing myself to be available to other people to pour into me or to be available for yeah. God to pour into me through others. Yeah. I think you're really on to something there that um, everybody's got a different way of coping uh, with seasons like that. But I'm like you as 
uh, you know, I'm kind of, a, I don't know if you're an introvert, but I'm an introvert and I tend to, yeah, go into myself and which can be the exact wrong thing <laughs> to do. Right. Um, because, yeah, I think one of the ways that God speaks to us in real time, I mean, he does it through scripture, he does it through the Holy Spirit, he does it through the world that he's made, but a huge way that he does it is through other people. And um, that's what I think church is for. That's what community yeah. for, is for. That's what friendship is for. And that, and sometimes we have to believe for each other. You know, when, when one person can't believe the community can believe for you for a little while yeah. and, and God can say things to you through another person that you're not capable of hearing from him in any other way at certain seasons in your life. So yeah, community is, is huge. It's so important to open ourselves up to, meaningful relationship with other people. And and those relationships are sometimes lifelong, but they're sometimes for a specific period of time. And mm. uh, and I and I think about you've probably talked about this a ton. You're probably sick of talking about it, maybe you're not, about the relationship that you had with Rich Mullins. I mean you helped write a book about him. You went on tour with him. In fact, my first real exposure to you was a concert that I promoted with you and Rich and Ashley in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. That's so fun. Huh. I had forgotten that connection. Yeah. But the oh. whole the whole relationship that you had with him was obviously cut short. He was as I understand it, he was kind of a mentor of such, of sorts for you, right? Well, yeah, I don't want to I I'm always kind of shy about that because it's not, you know, there were people that were very close to Rich and I you know, I I didn't know him that well, but okay. Uh, but I am so grateful for the extent to which I did get to know him. And I certainly considered him a friend and, and more so a hero and a mentor. You're right on a bunch of different levels. So when my uh, recording career uh, started in 1995, um, and that's when my first album came out. Right. And uh, I got invited to go on that tour. You just mentioned with, with uh, Rich and with Ashley Cleveland, the Brothers Keeper Tour. And that was actually like 18 months before Rich uh, was tragically killed. Um, and so we did, I think, 63 cities in 10 weeks. So I try to remember where Portland was on that. Was it getting close to the end? I don't remember the time frame, but yeah, it was in the middle there somewhere. So. Yeah, I think yeah, I think we made our way west. So I think we we're you, pro you probably got us pretty crispy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just remember you were all in vans and not in a bus, and that was odd for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Rich did not did not like tour buses, so yeah, we were all in cars and vans and things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I had I was still a little bit out of the. Christian bubble. And there were things about Rich when I was first getting to know him that were a little bit startling to me. Like he was a little right. bit rough, rough around the edges. Um, but boy, you know, after probably a couple of weeks touring with him, I started to see, oh, this guy, this is a guy who, like they said about David in the Psalms, a guy who is not perfect, but he is after God's own heart. Yes. Like he, he really really loves God and he really wants to know God so much so that he really doesn't have any time for, you know, what I've come to call image management, you know, mm. for, for trying to <laughs> yeah. manage, you know, people's perceptions of him. And, and um, yeah, so he kind of let it all hang out there, but he was, you know, some things that were very striking about him. One is that uh, the way he was about the, the Bible, like the Bible was a very alive book for him. He thought uh. it was, um, hilarious and riveting and and characters in the bible you know like abraham or isaac or jacob were kind of like his friends you know very wow. very real to him yeah and so again for me as a kid raised in the church i was kind of like reading the bible every day like taking a vitamin because i knew it was good for me <laughs> you know but but rich's engagement with it he just thought it was just a fascinating great book and so he kind of helped uh, reinvigorate scripture for me or helped mm. me re-engage with scripture in a new way. And then, you know, even the way that he conducted a tour, I'm just so grateful that he was the very first artist I ever toured with because, you know, I learned later that when you're the, I was the opener for the opener, right? right. I was the yeah. absolute, you know, lowest rung on the, on the ladder. And so, you know, I learned on later tours that of course there's a hierarchy. And when you're the, when you're the opener, 
you know, your sound's not as loud and the lights are still halfway up and that's fine. Yeah. That's normal. That's as it should be. But Rich ha- would have none of that. Like he just, I got full sound, full lights. He knew that uh, a lot of people hadn't heard of me yet. So he would walk out at the very beginning, you know. I remember that. With, yeah. Right? Yeah. Usually with no shoes on and yep. his hair still kind of wet from his shower. He would have just gone for a run. Exactly. He, yep. You know, but he would come out and he'd say, hey, everybody, I want you to meet my friend Carolyn. Like he just was so generous and deeply kind in a in a in a very unusual way um Mm -hmm. a way you certainly didn't have to be um uh to make it easier for me to to help me share my music with the world and just that that generosity and others centeredness uh um and again just sort of not just that lack of image management um boy that's that has stayed with me my whole life and certainly shaped, I hope, the way that I've approached uh, having a career in music. Well, you add that to the Tom Jackson uh, advice yeah. to love others, mm-hmm. that that changes everything. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's no longer about me being on stage and being the star. It's about how do I connect with people and share this great news that I feel God's given me to share with you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Rich modeled that so well. I mean, he... Uh, there's that um, that famous C.S. Lewis quote that humility, what is it? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less often, mm. right? Yeah. Um, it's just not not particularly thinking of yourself one way or the other much at all. And And Rich really had that sort of lightness of being in that sense of... Yeah. Uh, yeah, just he, he thought that there were, I, I think, at least the way I experienced him, that there were a lot bigger things to think about than yourself. And, and I remember um, he would say, you know, people will say, how do you stay humble when you're a Christian musician? And he yeah. would say, I stay humble because I'm a Christian musician. We So many goofy things happen. We say so many stupid things on stage yeah. every night or, you know, hit yeah. so many bad notes that... Um, yeah, and that's and that's absolutely true. I mean, he was in many ways larger than life, but he was not. Uh, he didn't need for it to be about him. The way that that a career on a stage could could nurture right. in somebody, it didn't it didn't happen with him because you're right. He just he was other centered and God centered and and um, and had a life that was pervaded by love. Well, I didn't mean to take this big diversion about Rich because ultimately we're talking about Carolyn. Oh, but I'm uh, always happy to talk about Rich. <laughs> but so, so you had uh, two or three albums out on Reunion, and then you uh, eventually you went independent. I know, and one of the things that I was excited about when we first started talking about uh, this interview or this uh, conversation is, I was excited to help you get started on your latest pro- your latest Kickstarter project. And I was trying to get this done in time so we could air it before the end of the Kickstarter. And then, what was it, nine hours and you were fully funded? Something like that? (laughs) Although I would say, yeah, I mean, that was pretty remarkable. And thank you. Thank you for wanting to help. I will say that, you know, ask any independent musician and uh, we can always use more money. You know, like there's there's lots more. I mean, we, we, um, we budgeted the the Kickstarter at kind of like what is the absolute least we can raise and get this done. And so, yeah, all the extras is, is a huge blessing, a huge gift helps us do a lot more, but yeah, it, the response was pretty, pretty encouraging, especially in this time, you know, we're in this weird time with, yep. um, with the coronavirus and a lot of th- other things happening in the world. And I really wasn't sure if this was the right time to try to, crowdfund something new but i think the response just shows how much music really does matter how much it really is um a gift from god that um encourages us gives us strength connects us with each other and with him and so that's been really kind of powerful to see um how much how much it really does matter so kind of my my intent of going this way is uh, talking a little bit about the difference of being a uh, a signed artist to being right. an independent artist. What are those? What are the the good changes? What are the hard changes in that transition for you? Yeah, it's a great question. I so I actually did four records with Reunion from ninety five to about two thousand. Right, seize the day yeah. was the last. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, she's the day in other stories, which was sort of like a, a bit of a greatest hits of the first three before that. And, uh, and then, yeah, I, I, I guess it was maybe we went our separate ways in about 2001 when I had my daughter, Beth, who was our second child with right. the first child. I was still kind of um, porting him around on the road with me. <laughs> When we had our second kid, we we're like, uh, I don't think I can. I want to keep doing music, but I don't think I can tour at that level, you know, especially because I was living in Canada. Yeah, I don't think I, I can tour at the level that they need me to tour at. So I went independent at that point. So, um, gosh, it's so hard to talk about signed versus unsigned um, in the abstract because the music industry has completely changed. Uh, so I think even for signed artists now, the reality is very different than it was for me when I was um, signed. Yep. Yep. So yeah. So, but the ways things are different now. So first of all, a pro of being an indie is that yeah, I tour when it's right for me and my family. Um, you know, we can kind of discern that, and there's not larger, uh, you know, a whole a whole company counting on me to tour a certain yeah. amount. So that that freedom is, it has been really good for our family. There's still been times when we haven't got the balance right. And I've been on the road too much or whatever, but we've had, we've had more freedom to discern and, and see, and, and, you know, more creative freedom too. I, I never really felt like reunion um, limited my, my um, creative freedom. In fact, one of the reasons why I signed at reunion was because Rich Mullins was there and he wasn't, hmm in any way a cookie cutter artist, you know, so, right. yeah. so I, knew, yeah. um, I knew I could be my quirky self and it would probably <laughs> be okay. But I would say, you know, even more so as an indie, you can just kind of do what you feel led to do. And, and um, if it's outside of the box, so be it. Uh, so that's all good. Um, but yeah, the, the industry has changed dramatically. I mean, when my first album came out, it came out on, CD and cassette, right? Right. And, yeah. What's um, a cassette? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, since then, I mean, even since uh, my last full length project was in 2014, even from then till now, that's a gap of six years. Yep. Things are completely different because 2014 things had gone a lot digital, but people people were still buying digital albums, like they would buy a whole album from iTunes, or they might buy they might buy your whole, your whole project from your website right. digitally. Right. And still more CDs at that time. Sure. And, and now so many people, um, you know, make use of streaming platforms, which are like Apple or Spotify, which are fantastically convenient. I, I do myself, but the, the, it's very different for an artist in terms of how they, how to finance their work. And, um, uh, you know, I'm, I actually have another job now, uh, right. which I love, love very much. Um, but I still have to figure out how to, you know, actually fund the creation of the work. So that's where something like crowdfunding is, um, is super helpful and a really kind of neat way to do it in community and, uh, get the music made yeah well so you you kind of teased it let's talk about this other job that you're you're now doing and uh Ooh. how did you get there um we have kind of a mutual connection in this that our, our listeners probably don't care about but uh <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about uh about renovari and how you got involved and uh what is what is it that you're doing there yeah so i my job is uh and i started it in 2015 I'm the director of education for, as you mentioned, an organization called Renovari, which uh, was founded by Richard Foster. Some people will know his book, Celebration of Discipline. I know you have some, some connections, yep. Richard. Yeah. And um, Richard, you know, 40 years ago, he wrote this book called Celebration of Discipline, which was about kind of looking at the history of people who have been following Jesus for the last couple thousand years and these different disciplines, which is not a very... A warm and fuzzy word, but these, <laughs> yeah. you know, different practices that help them connect with God, open themselves up to God's light and love in their lives. Yeah. And um, and when he wrote this book, all these churches were like, "This is amazing! Come, come, help us with this." And he couldn't be everywhere at once, so he started Renovari, and so it's it's known as a spiritual formation organization that helps people be intentional about their life with God. 
And I didn't even really know that it was an organization, but books by Renovari people like Richard Foster, like Dallas Willard, Mm -hmm. um, they have, they also, they have this book called devotional classics, which is all these kind of from the last 2000 years, writings, excerpts of writings from Christians that are really, really helpful. And I mean, years ago, I, I can remember being opening on the Stephen Cruz Chapman tour in 97. Our band was using devotional classics as our, as mm. a way to have devotions together on tour. Yeah. And um, so Renovari books and resources have been a big part of my life for years and years. And in 2015, I had, I had just finished um, getting a, a master's degree in theological studies at Regent College here in Vancouver. Okay. And I did that because I was getting, um, you know, through, you were asking me earlier about my non-musical writing, my prose writing. Right. And through doing that writing, I was getting asked to teach more and more and to lead retreats for people and, um, you know, guest preach and things like mm -hmm. that more and more. And I had really wanted to um, kind of enrich my soil, you know, if I was sure. going to yeah. grow those kinds of things. So, so I'd done <laughs> and I gotten this, this degree in theological studies and I happened to be on a Regent College alumni Facebook page. And I saw this posting that said, uh, Renovari is looking for a director of education. And uh, I, I, Boy, I I felt like, and again, we've been talking about how God usually works slow and yeah. subtly, but again, when I read that post, I felt like somebody hit a tuning fork and put it on my chest and I just started oh, to buzz. Wow. And I wandered out into the living room to my husband, Mark, and I said, I think I think I know what I'm supposed to do when I grow up. I think I, <laughs> I, think I should apply for this job. Yeah. So I, I did, and it's a long story, and it turned out 120 other people applied to 120 other people had had, you know, Renovari had meant a lot to them over the years, sure. too. Um, but it turned out, you know, eventually Renovari heard the tuning fork, too. And um, and so, yeah, so I work remotely for them uh, from Canada. Uh, and when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, I do yeah. a fair bit of traveling for that. And um, oversee something called the Renovari Institute of Christian Spiritual Formation, which is a two-year program that people can go through. And it's just really cool because I use music a lot for it. You know, I lead worship and, mm -hmm. and um, use music when I'm teaching, uh, uh, kind of teach. And then I go, hey, I have a song about this, you know, and yeah. it all kind of weaves together. Uh, but it just kind of is a job that kind of gathers up all the threads of my life and weaves them together in the service. Of something very that, cool. That I really believe in. Yeah. So it's very, I'm very grateful for it. And it's an amazing community to be a part of. So what is your day to day kind of job look like when you're working with Renovari folks? Are you, are you working with individuals, with groups? How does that play out? Yeah, so the biggest part of my job is overseeing the Renovari Institute. And so for that, I'm uh, designing the curriculum, sending out um, notes and teachings to our students every week. And then we also have um, these week-long residencies, again, when we can travel. Um, yeah. We have the week-long residencies at a retreat center together. And so I'm teaching at that, but I'm also hiring other faculty to come in for that mm -hmm. and designing these week-long experiences and I'm doing the music for that. And um, yeah, that's really cool. And then I get, I get to do other things too. Like I oversee our, our book club. We take um, uh, last year, it was a couple thousand people through an online book club for nine months oh, wow. every year. And yeah. Lots of different uh, really, really fun things with really interesting uh, people and people who boy, you know, when we were talking about how important community is in the life of faith, Sometimes it's just important to see someone who's been following Jesus for a long time, yeah. whose life shows that. Like that's part of what Rich was for me is like mm. you see what's actually possible in a human being yeah. who's loved God for a long time. And uh, the people I get to work with, bring in as faculty, talk to, be in relationship with are people that encourage me so much because of their long faithful lives with God. And it's just uh, it's really a privilege to get to work with them. Well, we'll talk a little bit about how, you know, we've talked, we've talked briefly about how community has impacted us, but now you're being intentional. Now, granted, it's a job, but I'm sure that's born out of a place in you where you're realizing God has brought me through some 
situations and experiences that are going to be helpful for others. So how do you make yourself available to those people, whether it's through the formal job of Renovare or, you know, even something else? Yeah, I think, I think one of the things we're supposed to do with our lives, you know, Mary Oliver has this poem, what, it's something like, what will you do with your one wild and precious life, right? It's, we're not here for all that long. And um, uh, so f- for this short earthly existence that we have before we go on to an eternal life, I think one of the things we're supposed to do is tell our story, you know, just honestly, um, when it's of interest to somebody, um, we're supposed to pay attention to the way that God is revealing himself to us in the ordinary stuff of our lives and then bear witness to it, you know, tell Mm. our stories. And if, if you happen to be a songwriter, that can be a great way to do it. If you happen to be a painter, that can be a great way to do it, but it also can just be going out for a Coke with somebody and being willing to tell your story and even, even better get them to tell their story. You know, Mm -hmm. Eugene Peterson used to say that we listen things into being. So just Mm -hmm. listening well to someone else and helping them um, discover what God has put inside of them that they're maybe not even awake to yet by Uh. just being a great listener. So I think there's, it's a, it's a, this beautiful kind of dance of we're called to tell our story and then we're called to call out the stories of other people by just Uh. being interested and listening. Being intentional about being around people so that when they have something that they share that rings a bell that you can say, ah, I see this in you, or I see this, I see God working in this in you. And sometimes you don't even have to say it. I, I mean, I think it's, I think you're absolutely right. It's great to say it when you see it, but sometimes just listening and you literally listen it into being like just listening interestingly. <laughs> you know, I mean, how many times have you how many times have you said something and then gone, wow, I didn't know that I thought that, right? Mm, or at yeah. least I'm a verbal processor, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's that's like I'll say something and I'll go, oh, I think that's true. That thing yeah. I just said it. And it's only because of the gift of people listening well to me that I've been able to speak something inside of me and realize that it's true. And so yeah, so listening well. Yes, saying out loud when we think we see something important in somebody else, but even more than that, just the ministry of presence, the the gift of presence of just being alive and awake and paying attention to another person can be one of the most important things that we do with one, our wild and precious lives. Well said. Well, Carolyn, I, I thank you for taking time to be with us today. As people are have listened, hopefully they're inspired to maybe check stuff out about your maybe your new music and stuff. Where can we find out uh, about your albums and the work of Renovare and and where can we find out more about Carolyn? Yeah, well, probably uh, just my name, Carolyn Aarons.com. Carolyn is the L Y N version, and Aarons mm-hmm. is A R E N D S. Carolyn Aarons.com. Um, I I have a section on my site that will lead you to Renovari's website, so you can find more out about Renovari. Perfect, perfect. Well, one of the things, and I think you know this because we've communicated on this before, one of the things that we're very passionate about, that I'm very passionate about, is prayer. So what is it that we can be praying for you for in the next uh, coming days and weeks as your new album comes out and so forth? What are are areas that our, our family can pray for you on? Ah, that's so great that you do that. Boy, in these days with um, uncertainty around the coronavirus, uh, for uh, for my work at Renovari, we're really having to listen hard about, you know, when is it safe to gather? When is it, you know, yeah. we've spent, you and I have spent so much time talking about community. And I think for all of us leaning in and listening to the Holy Spirit about um, a, when is it safe to physically gather and then right. what kind of um, situations? And then B, if it if we can't gather the way that we want to for a while yet, or as fully as we want to a while yet, then creativity around new ways to connect and have uh, community. So just prayers for, for wisdom and inspiration about um, how to do that community work well in a way that honors God and, and is wise and and loving for everyone involved. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's great for our world today. I, I've been impressed. This, well, our pastor lately has been talking about, yeah, 
just because the virus is here doesn't mean that God has stopped working. In fact, he's probably working harder than ever because yeah. people are probably more receptive than ever because of the uncertainty of our times. So Absolutely. yeah. How, how can we reach and touch those folks? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think asking for all of us, asking the Lord, what do you want to offer us in this strange time? I'm not, I'm not suggesting that the Lord engineered the coronavirus to teach us something. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, but I think God is so good at not wasting anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this isn't, you asked me how to pray for me, and the, but this is part of it, that yeah. I would be receptive and that, uh, that the people around me would be receptive to what does God want to offer us in this time, even if it doesn't look like a blessing. Um, he's really good at not wasting stuff at redeeming situations. And so just to be alive and alert and um, not wasting what it is he wants to offer us. So I'd appreciate uh, prayer for that in my life. And I want to offer that prayer for anybody else too. This podcast is a sister project to the Christian Music Archive, where we are documenting the albums we love and the people who made them. I invite you to head on over to christianmusicarchive.com to learn more about Carolyn Ahrens and other artists like her. This podcast is also made possible through the generous support of listeners like you. I invite you to go check out patreon.com slash ccmexchange to learn how you can support us and hear each of these episodes a week before they are released to the general public. As always, I'm really grateful that you took some time to spend time with me this week. If you have enjoyed this conversation, would you tell your friends about it? Because word of mouth is always the best kind of advertising. And while you're at it, check us out on all of our social media sites by searching for at CCM Exchange on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Well, that does it for this week. I'm really excited to share next week's podcast with you, so be sure and check back next Wednesday. Trust me, you won't want to miss this one. But in the meantime, remember that God loves you. In fact, he's crazy about you.